2 Corinthians chapter 5 is where we're going to go. And we're going to, let's go ahead and start reading in verse 1. It says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. I want to point out a few things here. First of all, this tabernacle that he's talking about, he's talking about our body, okay? We have right here, y'all are looking at an earthly tabernacle. It's, uh, you know, where my soul and spirit well and um, it's got its issues doesn't it I'm saved okay there I what the spirit that's within me it's a new creature right before this in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 or uh, in verse lost the spot yeah, maybe it's chapter 3 but before he talked about a fitting man being Christ he's a new creature maybe that's in this one I'm start, they're starting to run together on me yeah it's in this chapter we're going to see if any man being Christ he's a new creature okay and what we have living inside of us that was raised by Jesus Christ it's perfect isn't it it's something that's without sin it's something that uh, you know was resurrected by God it's something that cannot sin based on what we read in Romans chapter 8 but this earthly tabernacle that I am dwelling in right now, it wants to sin, doesn't it? It has problems. And so notice how he says, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon. Okay? We're ta and he's talking about our house that's in heaven, one that's made without hands. Okay? And I believe that's talking about our glorified body that we're going to have. Whenever Jesus Christ returns, when he comes in the cloud, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. Also, we know that when we see him, you know, we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. This mortal will put on immortality. This, uh, you know, will get rid of the corruption, put on incorruption. And as a believer, okay, if the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, there should be something inside of you that is groaning for that new house, okay? That's groaning for that new house, that one that's made without hands. You know, this body that we have now, it, you know, remember when God created Adam, he formed him from the dust of the ground, didn't he? And he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. This body that we have, it's earthly, it's, it's sensual, it has all kinds of problems. But one of these days, we are going to have a new body. And it says that we groan for that. And you know, when I read that verse, it worries me with a lot of Christians because it seems like there's a lot of Christians today that they do not seem to groan to be like Christ. They have no desire to be like Christ. There's churches today, I mean, if you start preaching on sin and naming any, and you happen to just nail somebody's sin, they get all bent out of shape, don't they? They don't want to go anywhere where they're going to get convicted. I mean, churches today are just getting so soft. Churches today, and I've preached about this before, I don't want to preach it again, but they're just all about the they're all about the people. You know, it's all about, you know, how we can all come together and build community and just, you know, get along and be happy and just lift each other up. Well, where do you see any of those phrases in the Bible? Okay? Now you'll see them all over in these books that are being written by all these new evangelical types. You'll find that stuff all over the place. But in the Bible we see you know, where we lift up Christ. We see preaching the word of God. You see sins being named. You see people getting convicted. You see them getting their hearts right. And nobody wants to do that. And it's like, you know, anymore, the new, you know, logo for churches anymore. And there's lots of stuff you can find with this logo on it. And it probably should be the logo of every church because it's what it's all about anymore. It represents what they're all about. You know, a lot, most churches... Uh, it, the logo's always kind of been a cross, right? Because it's always been about the cross. It's always been about Jesus Christ and what he did for us. Um, you know, in the charismatic movement, when that started getting real big, you started seeing the dove a lot, okay? They started focusing on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And basically the focus was really wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was having a good time, running around and shouting and, you know, getting slain in the Spirit and all that stuff. 
But it's like now the new symbol for church is a coffee mug. I mean, it, it's, it's all about the coffee. And you go into these churches, they got these coffee shop churches, as they, as they call it. And, you know, we have coffee here in the morning. But, you know, our church is not centered around coffee. I walked into, I was doing an estimate for this church one time. It was one of these big, mega, you know, charismatic churches. I had to go there and do an estimate. And I walked inside there. And the, I mean, when I walked in, man, this huge rush, this huge feeling came over me. It was a good feeling. I mean, I got a great feeling when there. I, it was a great smell. And it was a smell of coffee. I mean, they had like a Starbucks practically right there. As soon as you go in that church, coffee shop open all the time. Everybody's sitting around, you know, sipping their coffee, reading their books, uh, you know, having a good old time. And listen, I'm not against drinking coffee, but it's like coffee, you know, it, I don't know. It's just like the picture of relaxation, isn't it? I mean, my, I, I don't drink coffee. I just, I don't like hot drinks. But my wife loves to just get up in the morning and sit there and drink her coffee and read a book. It's relaxing for her. She's always wishing I would drink coffee with her. I, now, I don't under, now, now, maybe this is why we haven't went to one of these trendy coffee shop churches. Maybe I'm just missing something here. But I've never understood drinking coffee with somebody. You know, I've never had the desire to drink a Dr. Pepper with somebody. You know, what is it about drinking coffee together? Why do people want to do it? I don't get it, okay? I mean, maybe you have to be a coffee drinker to understand, but because I'm not a coffee drinker, I don't get it, you know? And people, you know, they, you know, they just love the relaxation. Getting together. And that's what church is all about anymore. It's all about relaxation. It's all about feeling good. And, you know, we ought to come to worship Christ we ought to come expecting to hear some preaching, expecting to get convicted, and expecting to get right. You know, churches, they've made the invitation in their services. It's, you know, it's more of a praise and feel good thing where they play, you know, emotional music and everybody gets their hands in the air and they sway back and forth. And, you know, instead of that being a time where, you know, it's time to get your heart right. It's time to make a decision about what you just heard. And it is the, it is the new emblem of all that. I see this on signs all the time. I, I just saw this on a sign in a church this week. And you know what the sign said? Coffee. And then below it, Christ offers forgiveness for everyone. Wasn't that wonderful? You know, but it's like, you know, that, that is true. But, you know, coffee, it's like now we've spiritualized the coffee. It means Christ offers forgiveness for everyone, you know. And it's just, but it is, it's that relaxed mentality. And the thing is, I... Can you imagine if I went into one of these coffee shop churches and I said, what's wrong? What, show me any, something in the Bible that says you can't have a coffee shop in church and you can't be all about coffee, all right? You show me something in the Bible. I can't, okay? I don't see coffee in the Bible, so I can't do that. But what do you think would happen if I went to any coffee shop church in America and I just preached a message on sin? What do you, let's say I pick a sin that's obvious as all get out that it's a sin that nobody has any doubt is a sin, and I preached against homosexuality. What do you think would happen in that coffee shop church? I mean, people would be so bent out of shape, so offended, it wouldn't even be funny, because you know what? Man, that's what's going to make them feel uncomfortable. And that is not why they went to church. They went to feel good. And do you think these people are groaning in themselves to be like Christ? They're wanting, somebody to, they're wanting to go to church so they can be soothed and made to feel good even though they've lived like the devil all week long. These tongue-talking churches, one of the big draws for the tongue-talking churches is you go, you live like a devil all week long, but then you go get filled with the Spirit on Sunday, and it proves that you're saved. Man, I spoke, I spoke in tongues again this weekend. I haven't lost the gift. Apparently all that drinking and adultery and all those things I did all week, I didn't lose nothing with God. I still got the gift, and people are always complaining of, I've heard people bring that up all the time about the people they see speaking in tongues on Sunday, you know, and in the bars on Saturday. And it's because it, that, that helps them feel good. You, people have different ways. Some people drink coffee. Some people speak in tongues to make them feel good. I mean, you know, it, what I'm saying, people don't seem to have that groaning within themselves to be like Christ. And I am afraid it's because they've not been... They don't have that new creature in them. They've not been resurrected spiritually. And Paul's talking like, man, we, we groan for this. 
we're ready to get rid of this tabernacle and get the new one that is made without hands, made the one that's in heaven. And then verse 5, he says, For we preach not ourselves, okay, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servant for Jesus' sake. This isn't about us. And notice also in verse uh, 4, uh, or verse 2. Oh, and I'm in chapter 4. That's my problem. Verse uh, yeah, four. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. Notice how the, you know, the clothing, the unclothing, the nakedness. Being unclothed in the Bible is always a picture of sin on open display. Okay? Now, I'm not trying to be, you know, I'm not trying to be weird or nothing here. But, you know, thank, thankfully, everyone in here is wearing clothes, right? Okay, now, we all know that underneath the clothes is nakedness, don't we? I mean, we, don't we, all, we all know about the human body. We all know what's there, but we don't show it, do we? Okay, that would be, it would be wrong, it would be obscene for us to do that. Okay, we, we keep it covered on purpose. It's a natural human instinct. I mean, Adam and Eve did it. As soon as they, I mean, after they sinned, they immediately knew, and they immediately tried to cover. Okay? They didn't do a very good job, but they did try, and we wear clothes to hide our nakedness. I want to read a few verses on that. Um, you know, if you can turn there if you want, but Ephesians cha or Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Okay, the word of God, it sees through everything. And you know, we can hide our clothing, or our nakedness with clothing. We can even we can hide a lot of our, you know, the, I guess the things we're ashamed of. We can wear clothes that maybe make us look a little skinnier you know they say if you're you know you're heavy you don't know, wear long stripes don't wear sideways stripes if you're heavy it makes you look bad or whatever you know we we've all heard that stuff and we can maybe fool people a little bit with our clothing but in the in the word of god you know it sees through everything doesn't it i mean it's all open it's naked to it okay revelation three seventeen. because thou sayest i am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich in white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see the shame of thy nakedness one of these days we're going to stand before God and when we stand before him a lot of times you'll see verses you know are you going to you know let talks about um, in one of the parables you know lest he come and you know, he's naked and they see his shame. Basically, what I think that means is for when Jesus Christ returns, the way you get caught naked is if you're not saved. Okay? If you're not saved, your sin when you stand before God is going to be on open display. Your nakedness is going to be there to be seen, your sin. And you're going to be cast out. But those who are saved, white robes are given to us, the Bible says. And those white robes, they cover our nakedness. They hide our nakedness. And they, they, it's a picture of the blood of Christ that covers our sins. It hides our sins. And there's also, and this is, there's also something wrong with people, and even people who say they're Christians, who just seem to have no problem showing their nakedness to the world. Oh, well, it's not full nakedness. Okay, So you, know, you want to show just part of your sin? Or all your sin. You know, you, you want some of it covered, or do you want all of it covered? You know, we always like to push the envelope on everything. And as a Christian, it ought to be just natural instinct for us, especially to want to cover our physical nakedness, just like we want we thank we thank God that He has covered our spiritual nakedness by saving us from our sins and cleansing us from that. We all know the nakedness is there, but we still keep it covered. Okay, and we sh we're supposed to keep it covered, and our sins need to be covered, and they're covered by the blood of Christ. And so then in verse 5, back to verse 5, says, 
Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. And that word, earnest of the Spirit, it's kind of like the earnest money you put when you buy a house. You know, they're going to, you put some money down to make, it's like their way of showing, hey, I'm serious about buying this house. They give them that earnest money. And God, he gave us the earnest of his Spirit. When we got saved, okay, we haven't got the whole salvation package yet, have we? Okay, we're not all completely saved in here today because we're all still sinners, aren't we? But when you got saved, when you called on the Lord, he gave you the Holy Spirit, didn't he? He gave you that earnest. And so, you know, you know, that's he's proving to us when he gave us the Holy Spirit that, hey, I'm going to come and get you one of these days. One of these days, you will be getting the rest of the package. You will be getting that new body, that one that's without sin. But we don't have that yet. We don't have. We want that tabernacle, okay? We are promised that tabernacle that's made without hands, but we don't have it yet. We just have the Holy Spirit that God gave us as the that earnest to show. Them. And if you have the Holy Spirit inside you, you will get that new tabernacle one of these days. And thank God for that. And then verse six says, "For therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body." We are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Okay, so we are, right now, we are not with God, are we? Why? Because we're still in this earthly body. We're still sinful. We, can't, we cannot stand before God in this condition we we would ruin heaven if we went to heaven in this condition we can't get into heaven until we get the new tabernacle until we get the new body and that happens at the resurrection of christ now notice how he says there to be absent from the body to be present with the lord now i'm not i'm not gonna i don't want to get too off in this subject but how many has ever heard of soul sleep you ever, you ever heard of that soul sleep All right you, you some heard of it but soul sleep basically is the teaching that when a person dies, they're basically asleep and they're not in heaven yet. They don't go to heaven until the, res the resurrection, until the rapture. Then they will go to heaven. But we believe and we teach all the time that, you know, ladies like Miss Beverly that just died early this morning, we believe that she is in heaven. Okay? Now her body's in a morgue somewhere. Her body we're going to put in the ground, and her body is asleep. Remember the Bible says, we shall not all sleep. Okay, We shall all be changed. The Bible talks about you know many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall rise. The body sleeps. Okay, One of these days, your body's going to die, and it's going to go to sleep. But your spirit, your soul, it goes to heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But your body's not there yet, is it? And one of these days, at the rapture, your body's going to wake up, isn't it? And so, there's no such thing as soul sleep, but there is body sleep. And it's what we call the physical death. And one of these days, that's going to be, you know, that's, that's going to be gone. But this verse right here is just is proof that when somebody dies, they are with the Lord. They are in heaven. And they are not just sleeping in the ground. Their body is. And their body will wake up one of these days. But the body has to say that the body's still sinful. They haven't got the new tabernacle yet. People that are in heaven, they don't have the physical body like we do. They're there in a, in a spiritual sense. Their soul is there, which is who we really are. But then verse uh, 9, so where we, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now, I, that verse right there, this is one that we, you know, maybe somebody could use. And say this is proof that you can lose your salvation. This is proof that you you find you don't have to work to get salvation, but you have to work to keep your salvation. Is that what is that what that's saying? You know, this is why we labor. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. What's that? What's that talking about? You know, why would we not be accepted if we're not laboring? Are we not going to get accepted? Is He not going to be okay with us? What's he talking about? Well, let's keep reading. And verse 10 says, For we must all appear 
before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. All right? So, man, the terror of the Lord. Is there a chance that we're going to get up there to heaven and he's going to look at us and say, you know what? Forget you. You, I, yeah, I saved you, but boy, you didn't do much with it. You, what, your life is not acceptable. Get out of here. Is that, I think y'all know better than that's what, you, know, you, you all know that's not what it is. But what does that mean exactly? Well, I personally believe that we'll see this in the rest of these verses here in a little bit, but because we know we'll be with him one day, we're supposed to practice today, okay? Because uh, I guess a good way to illustrate this, all right? Think about a young lady that is engaged to be married, okay? Young lady, she's engaged to be married. You know, if some guy comes along, asks her to marry him. Usually that young lady, in many ways, even though they're not married, they act as though they are married, don't they? And you say, how, how is that? Well, she doesn't, you, you, hopefully, she doesn't let other guys flirt with her, does she? You know, usually after that girl gets engaged and she gets that engagement ring, you know, they love to flash that engagement ring to some guy that comes along hitting on them. Hey, spoken for, uh, somebody's already claimed me. And you know what? They're proud of it, aren't they? They're proud. Now, they're not married, but they are spoken for. And so they do. They, hey, no, nope. you ain't getting none of this. I'm already promised to someone else. Because they know they're going to marry that guy, marry whoever it was that asked them to marry him. And so no one else is, you know, they're not interested in anyone else. Hopefully. I know these days we live in a messed up society, but uh, and it's hard to use examples like this. But let's, you know, think of a normal world, okay? <laughs> and so, but she, she doesn't do that. She And she should start behaving in a way that she's expected to behave when she's married, okay? I expected my wife to be faithful to me after we got married. And the six months we were engaged, I expected her to be faithful to me too. I, there would have been a problem if during those six months we were engaged, you know, she'd have been flirting with other guys and dating other guys and like, you can't tell me what to do. We're not married yet. Yeah, but we're going to be. And so in the meantime, you need to, you know, act like you're going to act when we get married. If the girl's not going to stay faithful during the engagement process, do you think she is in the marriage? Probably not. And we are not married to Christ yet, but we are espoused him. We are promised to him. And therefore, we should not be flirting with other gods. We shouldn't be messing around with other gods. We ought to be following his commandments and doing things you know, that he wants us to do. Obviously, before we got married, I wasn't her authority at the time. But there were certain things that she knew she wasn't going to be able to do when we got married. Okay, you know, if she... If she would have been out drinking, okay, during those six months, hey, we didn't do any alcohol in my house. Now, really, when you're engaged, somebody, can you can you tell them what to do? Are they under your authority? No. You know, they're still under the, their parents' authority. The parents say it's okay, but it's like, wait a minute. You were promised to me, and you need to start. I would don't you think I'm out of line expecting it while we're engaged? Hey, we're it was the plan for us to be a Baptist. Well, I'm going to be a Baptist once we get married. But in the meantime, you know, I'd like to be a Catholic for the next six months. No, <laughs> that's not going to work. I'm going to go try the Jehovah's Witness out for the next six months. Since I got to be a Baptist for the rest of my life, you know, I at least want to enjoy that or try it out for a while. That would not have worked out very good, would it have? And you know what? One of these days, we are going to be just like Christ. One of these days, we are going to be perfect. One of these days, we are going to be without sin. And God has promised that to us. And I don't think we are out of line to try to do it right now. To do the very best that we can to be like Christ right now. You know, before we got married, my wife, one of the things, she made some meals for me. You know, just kind of practicing the cooking. Okay, we weren't married yet, but she knew that was going to be a thing that we did. And so after we got married and so tried it a few times before we got married 
And the Mexican lasagna was an epic failure, you know. We, uh, <laughs> she tried to she tried to get me to like that, and I I told her I don't think I'm going to like that, and and I did. I was in love. I did everything I could to force that down and act like I liked it, but it had cheese on it and it wasn't happening. And so, and, and you know what? Thankfully, she didn't try to keep making that for me. She didn't, you know, because in in my diet there's not going to be the cheese, and thankfully. Uh, she made me other things after that that you know did have cheese and um, so you know she went when I first went over to her house or she was they ate meatless tacos. Who eats tacos without meat? That's not even a taco, okay? <laughs> you know we don't eat meatless tacos at my house. And I let her know that. they never had ice at their house. I like all my drinks cold, okay? I, I and we have ice. In our house, we're gonna have ice, and you know, those those could have been deal breakers right there too, I, especially the meatless tacos. But I mean, you know, there were things that even before we got married, she started doing just kind of in preparation as practice, and we ought to do those things now. Okay, we know God doesn't like us sinning, so we shouldn't sin. Okay, we know that. I mean, does anybody think that when you're in heaven, you're gonna be cussing in heaven? So we shouldn't do it now. Okay? We should be trying to be like Christ now because we have that hope. Because we know one day we're going to be like Him. We know we're going to stand before Him one of these days. And on Judgment Day, we're going to, when we stand there, you know, heaven is guaranteed for us on Judgment Day. At the Judgment Seat of Christ, everyone who stands before the Judgment Seat of Christ is going to heaven Heaven is guaranteed, but you know rewards are not guaranteed. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 16, you know, we're not going to take the time to turn there, but you know, it talks about rewards, and you can lose rewards. You know, we're going to stand before God, and our works, they're going to be tried by fire, and the day's going to declare it, and we're going to, after that fire goes and it burns all those works, it's going to see what's left. And for some people, there's going to be nothing left but their soul. They'll be saved yet so as by fire. They still made it into heaven, okay? Because it's the blood of Christ that saves us. It's not our works. But when we stand before God, okay, there are going to be rewards based on our works. And I, I'd like to have some. I, I, I want to have some rewards when I stand before God. And so heaven is guaranteed, but rewards aren't guaranteed for the believer. And it's more important to glorify God from the heart, okay, than from the outward things. Okay, because we've been talking about some outward things, you know, things we do, but it's really what's on the heart that's more important. You know, I'm glad that the first time my wife made biscuits and gravy for me, when before we got married, instead of the Mexican lasagna, you know, that, and she did good on that one. I was very pleased with that one. That would have been a deal breaker, too, if the biscuits and gravy would have been bad. Whenever I go to a new restaurant and I try their breakfast, first thing is always biscuits and gravy. And if they fail on the biscuits and gravy, I never go there for breakfast again. And it's just, it's a deal breaker. She'd have failed on that. She'd have lost her chances and uh, been missed out big time. <laughs> but um, we, but uh, it's more important. But if, you know, let's say that after she did that for me, all right, I, I, she made that biscuit and gravy that I wanted. I remember she seemed excited about it. And I would have felt bad if later I would have found out that she was so mad she had to make that food for me and she's up punching holes in her walls afterwards. You know, I'm glad it was the desire for her to please my taste buds. <laughs> I'm, I'm, glad she, I'm glad she wanted to do that. I'm glad it came from the heart. Okay, That's, that's important. And uh, like with the Mexican lasagna... Uh, that definitely would have been from the heart. I couldn't even fake that, but I just, um, God wants us doing things for the right reason because we love them. Sometimes people get caught up in doing all the outward things for all the wrong reasons. But look at what verse 12 says. It says, For we commend, commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them, uh, which glory in appearance and not in heart. Okay? There's a lot of people that have got the outward stuff down. They know how to dress. They know how to do their hair. They know all the right words to say. They know the lingo. But they do it with a horrible, horrible attitude. 
Okay? And you know, I, as anxious as I am for everyone to come to church, I just, I don't twist people's arm into getting to come to church. If I have to make somebody come to church, they're going to come with a bad attitude. And that bad, bad attitude is going to spread. I don't, I don't like making anybody do anything. I got, you know, there's enough things I have to, as a parent, make my kids do. Last thing I'm going to do is try to make church members do stuff. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to teach what the Bible says, and if the Holy Spirit and the Word of God can't get through to you, then good luck on Judgment Day. You know? <laughs> but uh, you know, you, you'll have enough to deal with with God. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be judge, jury, and executioner. I'll just scare you with that. But anyway, many though they do, they glory in appearance and not in heart, and that's not, that's not what it's all about. Verse 13 says, "For whether we be beside ourselves." Is it to God or whether we be sober? Is it for your cause? For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We ought to be zealous and excited about serving Christ. Be beside ourselves. It's talking about being zealous. You know, we know, we know it means to be beside yourself with something. And this zealousness that we have, right? This desire to do a good job. This is just practice for when we serve Him in His kingdom. Right now, our service to God, who is holy, I know it's got to be a joke. Okay? I mean, really, I, you know, have you ever had your maybe your kids try to do something for you to impress you and please you, and you knew they did the best they could? Maybe they made just maybe they cooked you something. And you knew they did the best they could. And you tried it and it was terrible. But you know what? You were still pleased, weren't you? Because you knew they did the best they could. They were trying to please their parents. And you know what? You got a blessing from them. Maybe they drew you a picture. And they didn't stay in the lines one bit. It looked terrible. Maybe they drew a picture of you and they made you look like you weighed 800 pounds. And... <laughs> But you knew they did the best they could. You knew it was from the heart, and it makes it special, doesn't it? And you're pleased with it. And you know, a lot of times the things that we think we're doing a good job on, boy, we think, man, the Lord must really be pleased with me. If it's from the heart, He is pleased. Okay, But understand, He probably looks at our efforts like we do our little children sometimes. Okay, He, he knows our heart, and if He knows we did the best we can... He is pleased, but he's not impressed. Okay, he's not he's not impressed, and he's and so he says in verse sixteen. Wherefore henceforth we know no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Okay, so after the flesh, we don't know anybody. We don't attach importance or significance to anybody other than Jesus Christ. Okay. In other words, we don't claim to be here as a church based on any man or any person. Okay, we are not Baptists today because of anyone other than Jesus Christ. Okay, like Catholics, for example, one of the big things excuses they use for being Catholic and why Catholicism is a true religion is because of Peter. Peter was the first pope. Where they got that, I don't know, it wasn't from the Bible. But I, I had a lady tell me one time, you need to be in the Catholic Church. The Catholicism is the true church. That's the church that Peter started. Jesus gave Peter the keys of death and hell. And Peter was the first pope. And they are attaching significance and importance to their church because of Peter. Well, Paul, you know, we don't know anybody after the flesh. We don't attach any importance to anybody after the flesh. It's all about Jesus Christ. Okay? I know some Baptists that attach great significance and great importance to being Baptist on John the Baptist. John the Baptist. He baptized Jesus. So Jesus was a Baptist. And you know, if you're not Baptist, you're not going to be in the bride of Christ. And one of these days in the New Jerusalem, when it comes down like a pyramid and hovers over the earth, only the Baptists get to go into the New Jerusalem. And you know, that's, yeah, you're looking at me funny, but uh, there's some teaching out there on that. And it's as goofy as all get out. But once again, attaching significance to flesh. John the Baptist was a sinner too. John the Baptist needed a savior too. 
John the Baptist wasn't even worthy to, you know, loose the latch of Jesus' sandal. He didn't have, he, we don't put any significance on the man. What's important is, are you in Christ? Okay? Are you in Christ? Why is that important? Because that's what's going to decide who goes to heaven or who goes to hell. And that's when we get into the very well-known verse. This is, this is a very well-known verse. Therefore, okay? What's the therefore, therefore? It, well, basically, it's what we've just been talking about, okay? We've been talking about this earthly tabernacle that we have, okay? This earthly tabernacle that it has a lot of problems. It has a lot of issues, okay? There's another tabernacle that we're waiting for. There's one that's in heaven. It's made without hands. We groan for that one, but in, we don't have it. In the meantime, while in this tabernacle, we aren't with Christ. We are absent from the Lord right now in this earthly tabernacle that we have. Okay? One of these days, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we are going to be judged according to the works, the things that we did in our body. We're going to be judged by those things. We're going to see if there's anything left. And for some people, there's going to be nothing left except for the Spirit. It's going to be, they're going to be saved, yet so is by fire. They didn't do anything for God. But if any man be in Christ, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that, that verse right there, you know, there's a lot of debate. What, what is that talking about? Because here, here's the question. And this is what people like to debate on, all right? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And now what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to talk about all the sins that I used to do that I don't do anymore. But, you know, I'm not, I don't want you to raise your hand, but, you know, how, how many of you in here, after you got saved, quit sinning? Didn't all things become new? I mean, didn't? You know, what, what, did you not really get it? What's going on? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. I mean, so did you not really get it? Well, what? Because here's the thing. After you get saved, we're still stuck with the same body, aren't we? What is it that's become new? Well, it's that new man that's inside of us. It's that spirit that Christ quickened within us. That is the new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's the part that we focus on. That's the part that's inside of us that's groaning to be clothed with that new tabernacle. That's what's new. This body, it's still the same old body. It's the, it's the same one that you've always had. It has the same desires. It has the same nature that it's always had. What's become new is that inward man. Okay, that inward man. Last week we talked about you know, strengthening that inward man. The inward man today of the Christian is very weak because it's not under any persecution. It's not going through anything difficult. And it's, you know, it's, it's become lazy. It's become weak. But if you're in Christ, there's a new, there's a new creature there. And, it's that, and verse 18 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Just as Christ reconciled us to him, it's our job now to be doing the same thing to others, reconciling them to God, getting them right with God. And who's who is it? And once again, a lot of times we forget because it's been some weeks since we talked about some of this, but thinking about the whole letter, what we've read so far, who do you, I believe he's talking about somebody specific. Okay, he's gotten he's gone into this whole thing, basically explaining, hey, that new creature, that's something that's inside of us. We've got this earthly tabernacle, it's garbage, it's sinful. We're waiting for the new one. We've grown to have that new tabernacle. But you know what? Jesus Christ, He came, He paid for our sins, He reconciled us to Himself. Even though we didn't deserve it, we, we reconciled. We got things right. And he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is your job. That is our job. And who do you think, he, and I believe he was specifically telling them, now reconcile this person. And who was that? 
Anybody? The man who had his father's wife again. He was, like I said, he's, he was kind of the focal point and the motivation for the last letter. And I think he's kind of the motivation of this letter. You know, he, there, there's a lot of stuff taught in there. But he's basically telling them, in the, in the couple chapters before, he told them to you know, allow him to come back in. Man, he's been punished enough. Otherwise, he's going to seem like something that you hate. Get, you know, love him. Get him back in the church. Obviously, he quit doing whatever it was he had done. And there he's telling them, reconcile him. And that's what we ought to always do as a church. There's people out there. They got issues. They've done things they shouldn't have done. They failed God. They failed the church. They failed you. They failed everybody. But you know what? We've all failed God. And we've been reconciled to him. And so we need to reconcile other people to Jesus Christ. We ought to have that ministry. We ought to, we ought to help people. We ought to work with them. I mean, sometimes you've got to hold their hands. Sometimes you practically got to carry them through. But that's our job. That's our ministry, that ministry of reconciliation. And, we, and as a result, and so also in verse 20, it says, Now then, so understanding all that, Okay? Understanding what Jesus Christ did for you, okay? You are right now, you've kind of, you know, we've got a dual citizenship, don't we? You know, we're citizens of earth and we're citizens of heaven. We've got kind of two people inside of us, don't we? We've got the earthly man that's sinful, but we've got the one that was resurrected by Christ that's without sin. And just like Christ has reconciled us himself, we're supposed to reconcile people, other people to him. We are supposed to Go to others on behalf of Christ. That's called being an ambassador. Verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. And though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's, that is our job. We go on behalf of God and we tell others, hey, you know what? You're a sinner. You need to be saved. There's a penalty for that sin and there's a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. He loves you. We have the authority to tell people that. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. We can go to, we can go to anybody. We can go to anybody in the world and say Christ loves you, He forgives you, and He will save you. We have that authority based on the Word of God. We are His ambassadors. We, we have the responsibility, we have the obligation to do that. People who have sinned against God, it's our job to go and try to reconcile them. Just like if something happened and we maybe upset somebody from another country, maybe let's say I decided I was going to go over into another country. I went over to Russia and I bombed the place. Okay, As an American, I'm going to make America look bad, aren't I? And chances are they're going to go and send in the map. You know, they might send John Kerry or the Secretary of State or one of our ambassadors to go to the people over there and say, "Listen, we, you know, we're on, this was terrible what he did. That was bad. You know, they're they're going to try to reconcile things, aren't they? You know, he's going to go on behalf of the president. Hey, the president had nothing to do with this. We that guy was a lone wolf. You know, he he you know we're not with him one bit. Trying to reconcile things. Trying to trying to make things right. Okay." Because, you know, I did a bad thing that caused conflict. And you know what? There, there are people out there, everyone, you know, everyone who's not been saved, everyone, they've sinned against God. They need to be reconciled to God. And he sends us as ambassadors to go to them, okay, who sinned against, you know, they sinned against God, but God sends an ambassador to say, hey, I want to forgive them. Okay? We don't, you know, we don't send somebody or the lost, they don't send somebody to God to try to reconcile. God, even though they're the ones that we're the ones that sin, God sends us to those who sin against Him. And I guess that would be like if somebody in America did something bad to Russia or something, and then Russia said, "You know what? We want to forgive America," and they send somebody over here trying to make sure we can find a way to make everything okay. That's kind of what God does for us, and we are ambassadors on earth and it's our job to tell others about the gospel of Jesus Christ and we got to be careful we have to do that in this tabernacle don't we and this tabernacle wants to sin sometimes but when this tabernacle sins 
we have a hard time being good ambassadors. We have a hard time, you know, sending the right message. And we've got to be very careful. And look, right now, we are not married to Christ. We are not with Christ. We are absent from the Lord right now. We are in this earthly tabernacle. But I believe God wants us to start acting like Him in the meantime. You know, even though we're not perfect, try. Do your best. And, you know, the title I signed on for this sermon is just basically acting like Christ until we are like Christ. Stop making excuses for the fact that we're still in the flesh and start doing your best. You can overcome this flesh. You've got something inside of you. You've got a new creature that dwells inside of you. The lost, yeah, it's one thing for them. They're dead in their trespasses and sin. But if you're saying there's a new creature, okay, and you need to start yielding your members to him, and if you do that, you will start to do things that are going to cause people to look at you, and they're going to think about Christ. And that, unfortunately, we don't have too many people resembling Christ, but it can be done. And remember John the Baptist. John the Baptist, one of the most amazing things about John the Baptist, many people thought he was Christ. And this is also neat. Somebody once thought, I think it was Pilate, when he heard about Jesus, thought it was John the Baptist. Think about that. You know, can you imagine John the Baptist? Man, I got mistaken for Jesus, or Jesus got mistaken for me. He probably felt like Brother Renee when people thought the picture of him was a kid when it was me. <laughs> that, was, that was probably blasphemous right there. <laughs> but, but I couldn't resist. But uh, just, just imagine, you know, imagine that feeling. We can be like Christ to a certain extent. And we need, we need to try. And if you, ha if, if you have that hope, the Bible says every man that hath that hope, this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. We're not there yet, but boy, we act like it. We, act, we, we, we should act like it. And I hope you do. So with that, let's all stand together. Acting like Christ. Acting like Christ. Acting like Christ. Acting like Christ.